recording. All right. So yeah. So once again, welcome to this um, our evening program. My name is Nora Dufalo. I'm the program director here at Tin Mountain, and we are so glad to have you um, joining us from your various uh, living rooms and other places um for this evening we're we're excited to do this it's the second time we have hosted a big night information session um before i hand things over and before we get to um before we get into it i do just want to take a moment to thank mountains nature program series sponsors um and they are hancock lumber White Mountain Oil and Propane and Farm to Table uh, Market and Catering in West Ossipee. So I want to recognize them for their financial support that allows us to put on programming such as this. I also want to thank all of you who are current members of Tin Mountain because additionally your membership dollars going go towards helping us to fulfill our mission, including great programming. Um, such as this. Um, I did mention that coming up, we have um, starting on Sunday and running through next Sunday, the 31st, um, we have our online auction, which is an annual fundraiser. Um, there are amazing items donated by organizations, companies, um, tradespeople throughout the Valley. We have over 300 items um, and there are some great um, great finds there. Um, there is a link to um, to register and to view those items on our website. So I would encourage you um, to do so. And again, that'll be going on all next week. Um, yes, but tonight, um, I, I'm not going to get into it too much, but because um, I have, you know, before I hand things over to Rick, but um, we have both Rick Vanderpool, our research director, and Allie Bird, our research manager, who will be presenting this evening. Um, what's great about this online information session is that even if you are unable to join us um, on Big Night, um, all of the information or the majority of the information is applicable to, um, to you. There'll be some great um, IDing, but also just the logistics, the safety for people, the safety for amphibians can be applied um, if you don't live in the immediate area of, um, you know, of Bald Hill and the Conways, you can, you, you can use these, you know, put these items into practice um, and do your own salamander crossing. So, um, but they will talk more about that. So um, before I hand things over to Rick to start, just a reminder um, that since it's been a while since we've done a Zoom program, if you have questions um, during the program while they're talking, um, the best thing to do is type your questions or comments directly into the chat feature. I'll be monitoring those and um, when we switch, when we segue from from one half of the presentation to the other, we may grab some may grab some of those questions, field those questions. Then, otherwise, we'll save the bulk of question and answer for um, for the end of the program. Um, and the last thing I will do is just ask those of um, ask everyone to please mute yourself um, so that we don't um, pick up any unintended background noise um, that might distract from other individuals' um, enjoyment of the presentation. And with that, I am going to hand things over to Rick. Okay, great. Thanks, Nora. Super job as usual. Here we are on a, yeah, it's still winter. Believe me, Allie and I were getting a little worried last week when the rain started to fall and on my way home, I saw some frogs crossing the road. I was like, we're too late. Oh my God, what happened? 20, 2024, big night happened and went before we got to do our program, but ah, we're back to winter. So all is good. Now I'm going to show some slides here in a minute, but first off, I want to thank Nora and Allie for joining in tonight and all of you for attending and of course, Many of you heard me speak before at Tin Mountain, and I'd 
do a show of hands, except I can't see, except about seven of you. If you've done Big Night before, yes, have any of you done Big Night before? A few of you. Okay, so some of you may know what this is, and I really want to extend a welcome to those of you, bienvenidos, if you've never been to Big Night, A, and B, especially if you don't even know what we're talking about, but it just sounded pretty good, so you're here. So with that, we'll just start with some slides. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and away we go. How are we doing? Everything good? All right. So the is singular, uh, but in reality, it's not, right? For those of you who have tracked spring or fall migrating amphibians across the roadways, we know that it just doesn't all happen on one night, which is a good thing. It gives us several opportunities to get out there and do our thing. But what we're talking about is, in fact, the crossing of amphibians across a road at a particular time of year when they are driving themselves either to their breeding pools, as we know them to be going in the springtime, most of them, and then in the fall when they're leaving some of those natal pools and finding themselves their hibernacula or their resting stage place for the winter time. And so we can have both a spring and a fall migration. And I won't, again, this is for extra credit. You might put it in the chat if you really want to get some kudos on this slideshow. But there is one species of amphibian that, in fact, does not migrate in the spring in New Hampshire and is, in fact, a fall migrant into the vernal pools. And if you think you know that species, put it in the chat and I'll do a shout out when we get to Q&A. So what we're trying to do really is to provide a slideshow tonight that cues you up to this amphibian migration in the spring and allow you to participate in what many of us call an act of service to the animal kingdom and specifically to the class amphibia and sometimes reptilia, but mostly amphibians. And really to try and help them on their way across the roads. As some of you, probably most of you have seen on a given good big night, you can have literally thousands of these creatures crossing the road. And it's just heartbreaking, has been for me since I was a kid, trying to convince my mom to slow down or swerve, whatever, when you hear the splat, splat, splat against your tire. And that's just not a good thing at all. And of course, these guys are slow. And in the late winter, the roads are cold, so they can't move very quickly. And so they don't have an opportunity like most of our mammals do to shoot across the road and avoid being hit. So that's what we have uh, uh, promoted. And that's what we're trying to promote here. And <clears throat> I'll do a, you know, give you a couple of other background pieces of information uh, that Allie and I put together. As most of you know, our amphibians uh, have a sort of three phase or three life stage uh, uh, life cycle that starts out as an egg and then develops into a larva, which is typically aquatic on a rare occasion. It's terrestrial, but mostly it's aquatic. And then, of course, they emerge from their natal pools or ponds or lakes or rivers as adults and move about. Some of them pretty much staying in those aquatic habitats, think bullfrog, think green frog, but others, as we will see, actually migrate quite a ways away from their natal pools, right? So what happens, of course, is that this period of time when they're active is pretty much restricted to the growing season. And it's the non-growing season when most of them are in some stage of dormancy, right? So they're asleep. And there's some neat features that I'll mention in a minute that allows these creatures to actually survive well through our cold and icy and often frozen winters. And let's keep hoping that they're going to stay cold and icy. So <clears throat> when we look at, consider big night, we're talking about, again, the frogs and salamanders that are coming out of their winter dormant state 
And that can be very close to their natal pool or sometimes far away, as I'll mention in a minute. But consider that these guys, as it I have on the slide there, can actually freeze. And you really can't say quite solid because if you pick up a wood frog, for example, which is loaded with propylene glycol in the wintertime, it's soft. It's soft as a sponge. And so you really have to wonder how is it they've adapted over hundreds of millions of years to this environment where they've developed a capacity to overwinter and not freeze completely and therefore die. These guys will live, as some of you know, for several years, anywhere from five to 10 years on our frogs and upwards of 25 years for some of our salamanders. And I'll mention that again as we go forward. Most of our amphibians travel at least a quarter mile to get to their natal pool. And they have, as birds do in terms of a sense of migratory nascents, where they started and how to get back there, hardwired into their DNA. So they're going to try and get back to those natal pools where they were born. And if they're successful, um, they will breed again year after year. So in terms of the big night, we're talking about the breeding migration. We haven't really done a fall big night. We probably could, but it's the spring that's really critical, obviously, for getting back into the natal pools. So this map shows you a little bit about how far these critters can go. And a lot of this data, believe it or not, was gathered by telemetry by affixing these little tiny, and yeah, you can imagine tiny collars around uh, just above their hind legs that have a radio transmitter in it. And I actually know some of the people who have done this and they're just about as weird as I am, right? So you gotta be a geek to really get into tracking amphibians with radio telemetry units. But nonetheless, what did we learn? We learned that spotted salamanders will average from a natal pool 817 feet. And of course, yeah, it might be 818, it might be 1,000. These are just average numbers based on data sets that uh, involve hundreds of individuals. Blue spotted salamanders, on the other hand, can go almost a quarter mile away from their natal pool. And I've actually seen blue spots uh, going over a half mile from the nearest natal pool uh, that they could have possibly been born in. That was in Effingham, so not far away from here. And then Jefferson salamander, fully a, a quarter mile away from their natal pools. And we've got some pretty good data on those. We don't have them so much here in central and northern New Hampshire. They're more in the southern part of the state. And then last but not least, the real absolute, you know, uh, Olympic athletes of, of out-migrating amphibians are the wood frogs. And that average of 3,000 feet is just one, again, one data point for some that will go over a mile away from their natal pools. So what kicks it in? Well, <clears throat> first we have to have some warm days and nights. And uh, yeah, we've had those, <laughs> which is why I was getting worried last week. We've had some nights that were not only greater than 40 degrees, they were approaching 50 degrees. And this winter being a little bit odd, normally we don't see this until absolutely the end of March or mid by mid-April. And this may take place, by the way, for a full month if we have sufficient conditions, right? Rains occurring during the day and or night, preferably both, and preferably a rain that is warm. So like you'll have 40 degree rainfall, 45 degree rainfall starting in the day, midday, and by evening, these critters are queued up. They're ready to go, right? Preferably little or no snowpack, but as I will show you in a minute, there are plenty of salamanders and frogs that will jump across the snow to get to those natal pools if the, the trigger goes off and they are on their way. And that often happens when we have an unusual now, a late winter storm, say in April of 10 or 20 inches, which we've had, and that happens to come in the middle of the, their migration. So they might actually move across snow to get to pools that may not actually be completely unfrozen. I've seen uh, Jefferson's and blue spotted salamanders go into pools that are half frozen over and they lay their eggs nonetheless. I mean, they are again, adapted to these variable conditions. So <clears throat> in terms of species, 
And I'm, this is my, I'm going to finish off my time with talking about some of the species. We've got basically these two groups, right? The salamandridae, the family of salamanders, and uh, the ranidae, um, and axiridae, but the frogs and toads are in one subclass that, um, you know, have a very different sort of life history than salamanders. Uh, salamanders are what most people come to find on the roadways uh, that they're moving, but there are still a number of frogs that can also move across the roadways. Uh, so spotted salamander. And I know some of you have seen these, perhaps you've picked them up. Maybe they've dropped into your window well at your house or found their way into your basement. These guys will go a long ways from the pool and they'll find whatever sort of warm, dark place that they can to overwinter. It doesn't happen. They don't overwinter in the same place. And very, but typically it is underneath a rotten piece of wood. That's the most common. So an old rotten log is where you'll see if you sometimes pull these apart or roll them over, you will find spotted salamanders under these logs. And these guys are really the, the icon of the movement of amphibians into vernal pools. And some of you have probably attended my vernal pool program. I've given that a few times at 10 Mountains. And, <clears throat> but keep in mind that, that these, uh, this species, the spotted salamander is absolutely restricted to a vernal pool for its breeding. And that, you know, it, how you define vernal pool is another topic for another day, but nonetheless, keep in mind that's where they're really headed. Uh, spotted salamanders have unique spots, as you can see by the, the photographs here, and you can identify these species by the position and size of their spots, which is kind of neat. Um, it's like, you know, some of us don't have much hair. Other people have a lot of hair, and we're all different. Well, that's true for spotted salamanders, right? So why not take a picture and then see if you can find that one the next year? Maybe it'll be a little bit bigger, you know. Plus, you can also, with a little bit of practice, learn males from females and understand how they move and when they move and how they congress together in these vernal pools. Another exciting thing to do. It's not just finding them on the road, crossing the road, but actually going to a place where they have landed, a vernal pool, and checking out what they're doing at night, typically, in the pool. And of course, you know, that gets into the sort of X-rated stuff. We won't talk about that tonight. But being that being said, keep in mind, our spotted salamanders uh, have adapted over millions of years to do this. And that's one thing we can count on that they will move in the spring towards their pools. And that's why big night is a very important night, uh, hopefully, for many of them. Probably second in terms of abundance on the roadways when we're walking with our flashlights and trying to find these guys and helping them across are these what they call red-backed salamander. Uh, we can call them the Eastern red -back. That's what the E4 is for. However, uh, keep in mind that Eastern red -back is a broad, broad species complex that involves, as you can see here, species that have color morphs uh, from A to Z, really. Uh, the ones on the right, you can see sort of a, what they call a lead back coloration. You see a pale orange, or you can see on the left there, what they call an erythristic or reddish uh, coloration on the red back salamander. Uh, a really cool one, which I would love to hear from any of you that find these, it'd be really awesome, are black ones. They're actually called melanistic forms. And they're solid black, except for very light speckling. And they're pretty rare in northern New Hampshire. They're much more common as you go farther west and south. Uh, I found them pretty much in most of the counties of the state, but I didn't even know they were, you know, redbacks when I first found them. So keep in mind that the coloration on these guys are, are variable. Another thing about redbacks, which is really cool, um, you're looking at the most abundant amphibian in the northeastern landscapes, right? We're talking upwards of 450 per acre in a site that has optimal breeding and resting habitat. 
450 per acre. You do the math, it's like one every other square feet. <laughs> so it's pretty, pretty dense. And what is also cool is that they're the most terrestrial of our salamanders. Uh, the Plephodon genus has a number of species that actually don't need to go to water. And in this case, they're actually just moving from one spot on the roadway or from one spot in the woods across the road to another spot in the woods. And the rainies, rainy, warm spring uh, uh, weather triggers their movement to disperse from where they've been all winter. And that helps, of course, with the genetics and the metapopulation uh, uh, breeding results. Uh, so redbacks, keep in mind, these are very, very common. Uh, Next, we have the two-line salamanders. These are quite a bit more uncommon. I wouldn't say rare, but they're very uncommon on roadways, whereas typically uh, being a stream salamander, that's where you really have to look for them. They're, they're pretty much restricted to riparian zones, and you might get them on a road if you're crossing over either a stream uh, on a bridge or a culvert or some type of riparian pathway or corridor, that's where you'll probably pick up two-line salamanders. And this one is our uh, stream sal salamander, like I said, and, and one of the three that we've got in the state and the most common one. Notice on the right, you've got a little bit of spot speckling uh, and the tail is somewhat a uh, brush shaped at the tip. That indicates a larval uh, uh, two-lined salamander. The others are, are adults. And you can see they're, as adults, much more uh, bright yellow. Also in streams are these guys, the northern dusky salamanders, Desmognathus fuscus. Fuscus means sort of fuscus brown. Uh, good name for the coloration. The biggest difference, if you look at the guy on the right particularly, um, and that is a guy, by the way, that is a male, uh, you'll notice that the hind legs are kind of fat. That's the biggest segregation. If you happen to get a two-line salamander and a northern dusky, the fattish legs and the hind legs rather are what triggers you off to uh, uh, identifying this as a dusky and not a two-line. And these again are not common on the roadways because really they're a stream associate and therefore not going into the vernal pools like the spotted salamanders are. And then sort of last but not least in terms of the small salamanders is this one, the four toed. And for a long time, uh, I never knew they existed, uh, even though I was studying vernal pools and had had done a bunch of uh, drift net trapping and stuff, never came across one. And Tom Tining, who used to teach with me at, at Antioch, uh, said, you got any forested swamps? And I was working on a research site in Keene. I said, yeah. And he says, well, take a look under the sphagnum in a forested swamp. And I was really, you gotta be kidding me. And lo and behold, underneath the sphagnum in a forested swamp are these guys that are also uh, like plethodons, largely uh, terrestrial and don't need much for an aquatic habitat. These swamps aren't necessarily inundated with water, water except in the wintertime. So, but notice the sculpturing on the back that you've got the actually, you know, physical indentations along the ribs and uh, in the upper part of the head. And those sculptured sort of indentations are what segregate this really from a redback salamander. Otherwise they can look very, very similar. And then last but not least in terms of our stream salamanders is this guy, the Northern Spring Salamander. And this one is really a great one to find if you're lucky enough. It's on, a, on our state rare wildlife list. Uh, I just saw the updated species of greatest conservation uh, need list today, and this one's still on it. We still don't have a lot of these guys, and I've only seen a handful myself, uh, and only one I've ever seen on a roadway as many times as I've done it. So count on the fact that if you find this, you should take a definitely take a photograph, look close, and make sure this is the species. Notice how the eyes are bulging forward and outward. That's a really good keynote mark. 
Also, there's this fine dark speckling throughout the body, mostly on the dorsal side, but a little bit on the ventral as well. And notice that the color variation will be from this sort of brownish orange to a brighter uh, creamy orange to a bright red. Uh, porphyriticus in Greek means bright red. So it's a pretty good epithet. And then our spotted newts, which most of us know in the F stage will also be crossing roadways and we'll see them in the F stage, not in the aquatic stage, which we see on the left here. That's an obligate aquatic individual. I yanked out of that pond just to take a picture, but otherwise it would be going back in the pond. The ones that are moving on the roadways will be these uh, red spotted newts in the F stage. And again, these are, uh, as I said before, sometimes moving over the snow. Uh, they'll live from in the aquatic state for the first two years, then emerge on the second, on the third spring. They'll be out and about for five to seven years afterwards as red Fs and then return into the uh, natal pools as, as a, an adult larva, which then is ready to breed. So these guys are longer lived like some of our salamanders and, and have these uh, uh, some unique features to them. Okay, frogs. Yeah, we gotta get back to the sort of the, the business at hand with our longer legged, more agile and faster moving creatures. And uh, yeah, you don't have to capture these guys. A peeper, if it's laying there in the middle of the road and cold as ice and, and you know not moving, that's one thing. But if it's a warm enough night, all you have to do is kind of shoo them across the road because they'll be jumping, as you know, a foot or two feet uh, every time they leap. Peepers have this incredible ability to uh, hold on to vertical surfaces uh, using those suction pads on their uh, front and hind feet. Those little round pads on the outside uh, actually have a membrane that will adhere to the surface uh, through suction. And that's, again, a long, an old adaptation to being able to uh, inhabit shrub swamps and other types of forested environments where they climb up into the, uh, uh, the shrubs and trees to, to avoid getting eaten if the, being in the water. And that's, uh, besides that, they've got great coloration that makes them almost invisible on the forest floor. Keep in mind, these are, as you can see in the hand here, not very big. We're talking an inch, inch and a quarter long at the most. So this is our smallest uh, frog species um, that's moving across the roadways. Next in size will be the gray tree frog. And for the most part, we'll be seeing the, the ones here on the left and center in the adult form. The immatures or juveniles don't generally move very far from their natal pools until they become adults. And at that time, then they tend to disperse more widely across the landscape. And these guys are just cool. I mean, can you imagine being bright green when you're young and then not only growing up and having different uh, patterning on your, on your skin, but being able to adapt those colors to wherever you are? This one, more grayish. This one, a little bit more greenish. I've seen them brownish. And depending upon the habitat they're resting in, uh, they'll adapt those colors so that they um, um, are more camouflaged and hidden from predators, hence versicolor. Right? And then, our, our, as, as I said before, our sort of master migrant, the wood frog, uh, or as I grew up, my grandfather and call them state troopers because of this stripe through the eye. And that's just an old, I'm showing my age and it's probably politically incorrect to say that, but that was what we called them when we were kids. Uh, nonetheless, the males, which are somewhat smaller and more pinkish and the females, which are larger and more brownish are both very common on our roadways. These will be the ones that are headed to vernal pools as well and um, have a pretty high fecundity throughout the Northeast, uh, ranging as the map showed upwards of 3,000 feet from their natal pools. And I've seen them even much farther away, as I said before. 
So this will be one of the most common ones that we see in terms of the spring migration. If things really warm up fast and we get to 50 degrees or higher at night, we'll see more of these guys, the pickerel frogs, which have bright yellow undersides and undersides of the legs, otherwise have this sort of pickerel uh, spotting pattern on the back. And this one, again, not very common in the spring, more common in the early summer when the rains hit, uh, they'll be going to permanent water bodies, whereas the wood frogs will be going to your vernal pools to breed. And last but not least, in terms of the frogs, you have the green and the bullfrog, and not unlike the pickerel, you've got uh, a slightly later time period for their movement. So we don't tend to get a lot of them during our big night um, or big nights, I should say, but they could occur. Uh, the bullfrogs particularly have a really long dormancy period and I hardly ever see them or hear them before early, early May, sometimes as late as the end of May, depending upon the season. You'll note the difference in the size of the tympanum on the bullfrog versus the green frog. Um, and that's sort of helpful to distinguish the two if they happen to be side by side. Generally speaking, uh, the dorsolateral ridges, which you see extending back behind the eye on the green frog is also a really good feature that will help identify it. You'll see in the bullfrog here, there's no dorsolateral ridge. And in terms of our other frog, which we don't have depicted that we could get, but I'd be very surprised, the mink frog, um, that will be a pretty uniquely uh, a patterned individual. Uh, and if you happen to capture, capture a mink frog, A, you're probably in Coas County, uh, or, and B, your, your, your hand is going to stink a little bit, hence the name mink frog. All right, so that's, those are the frogs. There's just one toad we have up here, and uh, this will wrap up the species. Um, American toad, you can see again that the males are a little smaller than the females. Uh, there's a two and one, and they're active breeders, as you can imagine. Uh, we've got uh, thousands and thousands of eggs that are laid by each individual when they reach their breeding pools, and, it, and they live for a long time. They live well over 15 years, and I've had some at my house for 10 years in a row, and I just watched them get bigger and bigger until I can't imagine them. Now, you know, start thinking about the giant Texas toads invading New Hampshire because they get so big. But we only have this one in northern New Hampshire, and that's also one that we'll probably see if the nights get warm enough uh, uh, in the evening. All right. Quiz for you. And I know we don't have a survey form, but uh, just to distinguish a couple of the lookalikes, these guys can be absolutely the same size. We talked about both of them. And don't worry, this person is not going to get warts from touching the back of the American toad. Uh, but in certainly, uh, if you're lucky enough, you'll be able to see the coloration of green and the very fine smaller warts that are not discolored and aren't circled in any kind of black coloration of the tree frog. And then last but not least, two other lookalikes I mentioned. Notice the reddish back on both, but in this case, notice the absent, absence of distinct uh, sculptured back and the presence of some sculpturing on the head and the upper back uh, thorax, actually, uh, of this one. So that also notice that this one is sitting on its egg. So this one, I should say, is a female guarding her eggs under the sphagnum moss. Uh, and that's something, if you look at how many eggs the, the um, whoop, how many eggs that the four toad salamander has, yeah, there's quite a few more, anywhere from, you know, five or six to 20, whereas the redback salamander only typically lays anywhere from two to five or six eggs in there in a cluster. All right, so that's it for species, and I will stop my sharing and turn it over to Allie, who will finish up on some of the details of Big Night. Thank yes, you. absolutely. All right, let me share here. 
Do, 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 do. Okay. Let me go into. Is that all the way at the beginning now, huh? Let's see here. Okay. Thank you, everyone who attended, as uh, Rick had said before. And I just want to introduce myself. I'm Allie Bird, and I am the research manager here at Tin Mountain. Just started in January, so I'm really excited. This is actually my first citizen science event. So, um, I'm ready to like dive in and uh, really get to know the people of the citizen science community of Tin Mountain. Uh, Rick has already covered what a big night is and the species. And so to just see where we're at in our outline, we're gonna talk about our goals, why are we doing this? And then also what to expect and how to prepare. Um, and then we'll do a Q and A at the end with Rick and I, in case anyone has any additional questions. So, as has been mentioned, we're doing this to help salamanders and frogs safely cross the road. And what that does is increase amphibian survival. So if you don't want to know the species or you don't know the species and you're not necessarily able or interested in coming to the big night, but you still wanted to make a contribution, if you went out on a warm rainy night, it doesn't even have to be what we call the big night, if you moved a salamander or frog safely across the road, you would increase survival of that individual because you're preventing it from being struck by a car. So that is that the long and short of it is if we did nothing else, that is the crux of the big night, just making sure these individuals get across the road safely. And to that end, you know, that's how we consider locations for this effort. So if there's a road with a lot of cross, a lot of amphibians crossing, but not a lot of traffic, that might not be the best place to spend time because they're probably going to get across safely. And then, of course, you know, there's some roads that are much too fast and much too dangerous. And so you can't take the risk there. But essentially, it's, a, it's balancing like, is there a possibility for us to increase survivorship because there's enough cars that are coming by that they might impact the number of individuals that can get across the road safely? Um, and so beyond that primary goal, we do want to just collect information for Tin Mountain and for our database on the species and numbers. So even the data you collect is fairly straightforward. What species did we find and how many of each? So um, it's just to get a sense of, of movement in a particular area. Uh, we are educating the public as part of one of our goals for Tin Mountain. And so that is happening as we speak and with Rick's information and just getting, you know, even advertising these talks um, is helpful to get people to understand like what's a big, you know, they might look into a bit more, what's a big night. Um, and that in turn raises awareness about amphibian movements because I'm, you know, we're in an echo chamber here. People are here because they care, but there's, I'm sure, plenty, way more people that don't even think about the fact that amphibians are moving and they're driving and they're getting from A to B and they're listening to music and it's not even crossing their mind that they might be having an impact on populations. And then um, we are hoping to expand upon and improve our efforts at Tin Mountain. So last year there was sort of a pilot year that took place with uh, a group of people that went and helped with the crossings and so we're trying to expand that this year and and what you'll be doing if you come out to our event is helping us refine these locations so i'll go into some of those locations but you know what we don't know yet is is there an area that like wow there's just so many individuals crossing here we could use a lot of hands or yeah we tried we tried the stretch of road and there's not that many amphibians or not that many cars. I mean, that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, so this is one of uh, a map that Rick had put together. We had gone, Rick and I did some pre-con and drew, drew, hello, <laughs> drove along the roads to look for areas. We saw lots of vernal pools along uh, Pocatiquit Road, which is there um, just south of the word Conway. And that's just down the hill from Bald Mountain and the, or Bald Hill Road, excuse me. And then um, on Bald Hill Road where there was 
surveys done and efforts done for Big Night last year, we identified some other locations. But in general, what we'd like to do is repeat our efforts last year along Bald Hill Road. And so if you were to come out, um, we're going to have this as a walking route so you can leave right from Tin Mountain and walk along the route and try to help amphibians move safely across the road. Our other two locations, as were shown in that first map, are slow driving routes. So Rick has done this before, and I've heard of other people doing it as well, where you're just creeping along. And if you see any movement in the um, headlights, you can stop and get out. And then the reason I say with a asterisk likely, that's because there could be an, a, a stretch of road where there's quite a few amphibians cr crossing, everyone gets out of the vehicle, they're walking along and they're helping uh, amphibians cross. So if there, you were like, hey, I didn't want to do this to be in a car, I think there will be some combination of walking and driving just to be able to, to do this stretch of road. And again, we don't have a full sense of how long it will take. So maybe you only will only cover a small section if there are a lot of amphibians or maybe the whole thing is drip, you know, you drive back and forth several times, but we'll go in groups and everyone will be guided on what to do and how to proceed. Our final new location, oops, is the past the Conaway Road here. And so again, that's a long stretch of road, a lot of potential for amphibian movement just because of all of the vernal pools we saw on either side. And so uh, I feel like there's a potential for enough cars to be going by that we, we could make a difference, but also enough amphibians that need to be safely ushered across. And so if you come to the big night, what we would provide is a uh, laminated, because it'll be raining, ID guides of the common um, salamander and frogs that you might encounter. Um, you wouldn't have to worry. We'll have somebody from Tin Mountain with each group. But even if you and your leader weren't able to figure out what species you have, we can take a picture with a cell phone and then try to figure it out later. Um, so it's not a requirement that you have become an expert in identifying any of these species. Um, we will also provide a reflective vest that's incredibly important because as you can imagine, you'd be walking along the road at night um, in the dark. And so we have them, everyone is required to wear them, but I also put in there, bring your own if you have one, if you're a runner or if you do nighttime activities, you might prefer your own or you double up. Like there's no such thing as too much reflective gear in my opinion. And then we'll have the data sheets that we actually are using the Harris Center's data sheets because we're following a lot of the protocols and procedures that the Harris Center put forth. And so we'll have that on right in the rain paper um, and pencils and clipboards just so there can be one data taker for the group for the stretch of road that you end up working on. And so what we ask that you bring is a flashlight and just check it too, if you haven't in a while, make sure it has new fresh batteries. A lot of us have flashlights that have just been in the drawer for months. So it's nice to just make sure that they're going to last the duration of the time that we're out there. Um, don't expect to go out with a cell phone and be able to see well enough. You need like a, a stronger flashlight to be able to uh, light up the road enough to see small amphibians and frogs on crossing the pavement. You can also wear a headlamp which is just like double trouble because that you'll have your, you know, whether you're writing or you're looking from side to side, but you have your flashlight out. There also is not, there's no such thing as too much light up gear for the, for this night. So please bring along headlamps if you have one, obviously rain gear and warm layers because it can get cold, even if it's a warm night, you know, if you're outside for a while. Um, the spatula idea is for, uh, some people don't won't want to do this, but if you're willing to, you can um, count. If you're able to identify the individual, you can count it as a species that was attempting to cross, but then move it off the road with the spatula so that if you if you end up walking a stretch of road more than once, you don't count it more than once. Again, not critical, but you know something to keep <laughs> to keep the data straight. And then. Um, I have, oh, right, so I mentioned this on the other slide, but just bring an additional reflective vest or jacket if you have your own. If not, again, we'll provide that. 
And I feel like the something is cut off on the bottom here. Hang on. Oh, right. And your camera, um, which, or your phone, which will be able for you to take pictures. Oh, shoot. Of course you want to, um, you don't have to take pictures of anything, but I imagine you're gonna encounter enough interesting species that you might want to. Um, but it, it's most important if there's something you can't identify and you want to. Okay, so we just need to go over safety. Uh, obviously you want to be walking and having your headlamps and flashlights on, have your uh, reflective vests, vests on. For times that you are walking and you're not right at a vehicle, you'll want to walk facing traffic um, just for safety so that the cars can see you, you can see the cars coming. Uh, when you are with a vehicle, that vehicle will have its hazards on. And we'll also alert the police to what's going on on each of these roads so that there's no, um, you know, there's a bunch of weirdos walking down the road <laughs> slowly and with vests on, but what are they doing? Why are they doing it at night? It's raining, what's going on? So we'll, we will give the police a heads up. Um, goes without saying, but it's worth mentioning, don't shine your flashlights at the cars. Like they'll, they'll see you. In fact, if you want to light yourself up, point the flashlight at your reflective gear or at yourself or at your face, but you could, you know, in, unintentionally sort of blind the driver to you if you shine your flashlight at them to say like, hey, we're here. So just keep that in mind. And then um, just don't risk your life for amphibians. If you're standing there waiting on the side of the road as you should be when a, when a car is passing, um, the headlights might light up a, an amphibian that you hadn't seen don't think you can race out there and get it before the car. Hope that it doesn't get hit as it goes by, but your, you know, your life and safety is more important than the amphibians. And so we need to just take that chance, hope it doesn't get hit, and then try to make get it across the road after that car has passed. And then for the amphibians, for their safety, we just want to make sure that you have wet, clean hands. So say even you weren't meaning to do a big night or you're walking your dog around the street and you see, you know, just happen to see something during the daytime and you want to help it across, you can like put your hands in a puddle and help an amphibian across the road. It's not part of a big night, but it's again, going towards this effort of increasing survivorship. Um, on the big night though, we wanna make sure no one has any hand sanitizer on. That's not good for amphibians at all or soaps. So again, just making sure your hands are, you know, again, wetting them in a puddle, <laughs> washing them off on your rain jacket that's covered with rain, just keeping your hands free of any, any toxins. Um, and then just hold the amphibians at the center of the body. So don't try to pick them up by their tail or their legs or their head or something, um, which again, Probably don't have to tell most of you, but I feel like it's worth mentioning. So one thing that uh, Nora had mentioned at the beginning of this talk was the idea of, you know, whether or not you come to the big night, hopefully you can learn something that you can use by your own home. And so I just wanted to cover that right now. So if you can imagine we hold this event and let's say a bunch of people drive a whole bunch of miles over roads on a wet, warm night, you might be doing more harm than good. And that's obviously counter to what we're trying to accomplish. So if you're going a far distance or some other options that you might want to consider instead of coming to the big night, or maybe you come to the big night so you feel comfortable with the procedure. And then in the future, you just do your neighborhood or go closer to home. So that's sort of what we want to set the stage for here that we're not saying, this is where you got to be. You have to come to the Tin, Mi night, tin Mountain big night, um, that there is a plenty that can be done locally. So if you were to act local, you would choose a safe, you know, not too high of speed road near your house. You can choose locations that are near water. So if you know there's a water body or notice a vernal pool, that's a great place to walk the road for a little bit. Um, and then if you happen to see dead amphibians during the daytime, like a pit frog or salamander, then okay, something was trying to cross there, there might be other things trying to cross, that might be a spot to monitor during the evening when there's more um, individuals moving. And something I encourage anyone, again, the, the data is great and it's helpful to everyone across the state. Um, so if you do want to contribute, the iNaturalist app is fantastic. So you could use that as an, a, another way on you know, a little night, 
if you went out, went nearby and found a couple of um, amphibians, you can up, take a quick picture, upload it, then the location, it's geo-referenced. And that information, I know I've um, seen a couple of other talks and other um, nonprofits in the area that do actively look at this information on iNaturalist to look at population trends, but also just areas that could use monitoring. And then um, if you're going to be south of where we are at the Harris Center, actually, if you Google Harris Center crossing sites, they have a whole interactive map that shows locations where there are either official crossings, where their crossing brigade folks are operating, or they have um, just locations where they could use some eyes and a couple bodies to go and help uh, amphibians cross. We hope to contribute, I think our, our Bald Hill um, location is on the Harris Center map. And then depending on how things go this year with our other two sites, we can have them add that. So they, they do wanna grow that interactive map so people have places that they know they can go and, and make a difference. Um, and then the easiest option, honestly, stay home. So if you were possibly gonna go to the grocery store on a warm rainy night in spring and you can do it on a dry, cooler night, then just make that decision and, and let other people know um, that it can make a difference to just change your behavior during the spring, during these times when there is a lot of movement of amphibians on the roads. So that, I mean, to make a difference by doing nothing, is sort of a win-win. And remember, if you go out on your own, please put on a vest. It's amazing how you feel so present and you feel so seeable. I'm a full human. Of course, their headlights will spot me. It's not always the case. So just put on reflective gear, get reflective tape, pants. This is awesome. That guy has a triangle, whatever you can to make yourself visible so that you don't get uh, hit basically. Okay. So when is it going to be? We don't know. <laughs> and now we have a big snowstorm coming. So like Rick said at the beginning, we were like very concerned <laughs> that we were going to do this talk after it already happened. Um, but we're okay for now. Um, what we are going to do, so you can email me. There's the two options here for how to get on the alert list. We'll send out an email like you know, three or four days ahead, we'll be watching the weather carefully and we'll say, you know, we think it's going to be this night and then we'll confirm on the actual day because we want to make sure the weather doesn't change. Um, so you can email me or you can also, if, when you go, if any of you have signed up for other Tin Mountain programs, right now, if you were to go to register for a program, you can see it says four question mark, question mark, 24 big night notification. And so you can just put your information in there and that will make sure that you're added to the email list as well. Um, I'm also gonna make sure that we post it on our Facebook page uh, when we've chosen a date and then again, confirm that date. So there'll be a few ways that the notification will get out because again, unlike most of our programs, we can't plan this one ahead of time. Although even when we plan sometimes <laughs> the dates still change. Uh, so then for the actual big night, once we have a date, we're planning on three teams for those three locations that I spoke about. Um, each team will hopefully, everyone can go in a car, except for the one walking right from um, Tin Mountain, but go in a car together so that it's like as a unit. But again, we'll, we'll make decisions based on how many people turn out. The plan will be to meet at the Nature Center at eight o'clock. And we'll gather our gear, make sure we have our clipboards, our data sheets, our identification cards, our vests, and, and head out. And I figure, you know, by the time we get out, it might be 8.30. It's going to be dark. We'll monitor for about two hours and depart around 10.30. Um, if there's a lot of interest, if people are highly caffeinated, if we're seeing a lot of movement, we can continue after we regroup at 1030. But I figure this is good so that this is the a good spot for people to know what they're signing up for. The other thing to keep in mind is, you know, we want to prevent vehicle strikes and at around 1030, there's going to be less traffic than there is earlier in the evening. So, you know, as you get later in the night, there's diminishing returns to some extent. If you're out there at three in the morning, that's awesome. But you also, there also might not be any cards either. So your efforts aren't quite as valuable. So, so we tried try to kind of gauge it that way. And again, we're still learning. And so we might 
um, alter this in the coming years, but for, for this year, that is the plan. And that's it. That's everything you need to know. Um, I hope you're all inspired to either come to Big Night or keep your eyes out for places that you could do a Big Night near you. And again, please everyone be safe while you do so. Um, now I open it up. If you have any questions for Rick or myself or Nora, we'd love to answer them. All right, awesome. Thank you, Allie. I know, Rick, you've been busy typing away to a responses to a number of the questions in there, but maybe um, we could just pull to the forefront. So there's a great question about why, you know, needing to wet your hands um, so that, you know, the amphibians aren't absorbing um, oils or chemicals from our hands if they're dry. But um, there was another question about um, you know, if wearing like a nitrile, um, glove would be, you know, would, um, you know, would help, would eliminate that, um, risk as well. Yeah, I, I don't recommend that, um, largely because you don't know what might be on a glove. If it is a sterile glove, that's great. But then as soon as you pick up one salamander or frog, it's more than likely that you'll transfer whatever you've picked up from that salamander or frog to the next one. So it's better to, and this is something that it takes a little bit of getting used to, but um, very typically uh, what I'll do is actually, because the roadway is soaking wet, and the roadway contains hopefully non, you know, not too many chemicals on it, right? But I'll make sure that I wash my hands using available water, like in a ditch, roadside ditch, and then pick up the next salamander and then make sure my hands are clean from that. In other words, not try and transfer anything. I think I've found just hands are the best thing to use because you have the better sense of touch than like a spatula or a glove or anything like that. Um, I am sure that uh, some other people use different things like, you know, plastic cookie sheets or something, you know, or even metal ones, you know, that they can slide underneath and move the salamanders and frogs over. But uh, one thing with the salamanders is that mostly they'll be docile, but the frogs are gonna jump right off of whatever you've picked them up from. So with the hand also allows you to hold on to them for the 10 feet or more that you're carrying them. Great question. Um, one other thing that I just wanted to mention or clarify is that um, if you are on the fence about whether you want to be on our notification list, there is no um, there's no commitment in being added to that list. Like with any pop-up program, we recognize that the fact that we will be making this decision at the last minute um, might, you know, will mean that at any given time, a whole portion of our list isn't going to be able to make it. Um, but if, you know, even if you just, even if you know, you, you live a little bit farther away, um, even if you just want to be on that notification list, um, so that's something, you know, that's in your mind, so that maybe you decide not to go out that night, or you go out on foot and are just looking around, um, you know, in your area, um, you know, please don't, please don't feel, you know, an obligation, um, you know, to be down on Bald Hill or in the Conway area, um, if you know in adding your name to that notification list um we are we're happy just to um you know to be sharing that information i think it you know whether or not you participate or not that's a good point i have had uh, at least one person that said i, I probably won't come but i want to know when you're doing it <laughs> and so my thought is they're they're looking to go local so mm -hmm. yeah or maybe you're driving there and you see something you're like i gotta stop here and help these guys <laughs> But well, you won't have your vest yet, so don't do that. <laughs> yeah, are there are there any other questions folks have either about um you know about the the amphibians that you know that Rick went through or any of you know the logistics or protocol of the evening? I know we have some some veteran crossers um <laughs> here.
All right. Well, All right. Yeah. you know, uh, here's to a, a positive year. Keep in mind that it might be one night. I've seen it one night, very rarely, but I've seen it on the average, the minimum is two. And I've seen as many as six different nights. And that uh, that's, it will continue right in through the early part of May. My latest crossing night was the 14th of May. And that was a little bit of a late year. This seems like mm -hmm. it's going to be an early year. So who knows? And, um, sorry to interrupt, Rick. Aaron just asked a question about how early the amphibians start crossing. I know it's a really good like, question. Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah. If you should take it, but before <laughs> before you do, I know based on last year's efforts, so again, modifying things to make the experience better, um, we had left too soon. So I think we tried to leave around sunset and it was just, they hadn't started moving yet. So there's kind of some dead time. We went yep. all action, but go ahead. Absolute Rick. dark, absolute dark. So that's why we were not meeting till eight. And if we get out by 8.30, that's that's often when I get out on my route down here in Sandwich. Um, and yeah, they'll be moving all night. Uh, I have actually done it in the middle of the night uh, just to see what's moving and depending upon the rains. And that's another thing. You know, rains don't just like, you know, I lived in the Northwest where you can count it. You know, what's the weather? Oh, it's raining. Yeah. But here the rains come and go, right? So it might stop at seven o'clock and you might go out at 8.30 and there's nothing because it's not raining, right? Or it's a nice moist evening. It's sprinkling. It's starting. Nothing's moving, nothing moving. And at midnight, it comes down in a heavy downpour and that's when they all go. So, which is better, right? In terms of cars, but uh, it's always fun to try and see what, you know, predictions you can make on what's moving and what isn't, but yeah. Um, so, so Rick Amalia has a question on the other end of the spectrum. And that is, um, you know, you said dark, what about, and, and obviously it has to do with, with what's happening with precipitation, but what about individuals getting up early um like would they be cross would you expect them to be crossing at you know at 4 a.m so that's a really good question too and no not at that time if the evening has been good for crossing the only time it happens late late in the night is when the rains haven't come until like midnight or two in the morning and then they'll take that opportunity in darkness to cross but that's and that, i can't say that 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 I know all of that data because I'm not usually doing it at two in the morning or three, but uh, I have observed that to be true. I've actually gotten up and gone out at 4 a.m. when I thought, oh, this is probably the time and I found them crossing. So good questions, you know, and, and we will not call you at midnight. I will also say that, quick, get out of bed. They're crossing now. We promise not to wake you up. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody, for your questions. And feel free to email Allie or I, myself, if you have other ones between now and the big night. Thank you, Rick and Allie and Nora. That was very good, as usual. Thank you. All right. Yes. You and I, um, I'm going to stop the recording, but um, if you want to go back and brush up on your salamanders or, um, you know, on your amphibians or go over any of this or share it with with friends, it will be available. Um, it should be available tomorrow on our YouTube channel. And, um, you know, and, and again, you can email Allie, you can email myself, you can sign up um, via there's a, a link on our registration form. Um, any of those ways, um, if you're not already on our list, I know a number of you have already responded um, that you wanted to be on on that notification list and we hope to see more of you. Um, but yes, thank you, Rick. And thank you, Allie. And, and have a great evening, everyone. All right. Thanks for caring, uh, everyone. Thanks, Rick, Allie, and Nora. Yeah. Thank Bye you. Now. Bye, all.